I'm passing along a, a sign-up sheet. This has to do with the Fast and Feast seminar that's coming up next Sunday, if you'd like to sign up for that. And it is different from the previous one. I did one that was more specifically on fasting. This one is going to have to do more with the biblical feasts. And uh, we'll be walking through what's going on with those feasts in the Bible and talking about a balanced and healthy life. So check that out if you'd like. Uh, there are also up here, we had uh, folks from Green Lawn Cemetery drop off information. They have a seminar coming up. Uh, in, in pre-planning, if you're interested in that. So I'm going to set those right there if you're curious about that. I think the meal is at TAT uh, over on the uh, east side, if you're familiar with that Italian restaurant. All right, Romans chapter 1 is where we will be studying today. Romans chapter 1, and we're going to get through... Oh, just a little bit today, and we'll, we'll be talking about Paul's focus in the book and what he wants to get across as he's teaching. Uh, the, following, the following Sunday, we will get into a part of the book that uh, is probably going to prompt a little more discussion, uh, and, and that's because... One of the things Paul talks about in that section of the book is same-sex relationships. Okay? <clears throat> the scripture does not talk too much about that topic, but this is one of the places where it does come up and uh, is discussed by the apostle. So I'm, I'm saying that in advance so that uh, folks are aware of that conversation and, uh, and uh, what we will be getting into there. Okay. So, that having been said, let's go to Romans chapter 1 and verse 8. Let's have somebody start by reading us verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken up throughout the whole world. Okay, so Paul is getting further into his purpose for writing this large letter, and what is he thankful for, uh, for the Romans for? What's what's he uh, talking about there? All of them. He's thankful for all of them. For their faith. Their faith. But especially for their faith, isn't it? Especially for their faith is what he's thinking about. Okay, now I'm armed. <laughs> Is it erasable? Is it erasable? Yes, it's an erasable one. Uh, so we're going to see this come up as a theme in the letter, uh, an emphasis on faith and the importance of faith as we go. And we'll see how he develops that as we read along here. Someone now read for us verses 9 and 10. And uh, let's, let's see who had heard about the faithfulness of the Roman Christians. Verses 9 and 10. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you, always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. Okay, who had heard about their faithfulness, the faithfulness of the Roman Christians? Proclaimed in all the world. Yeah, do you think in China they had heard this? <laughs> okay, this is what we call hyperbole. Uh, there, there, occasionally there are examples of this in the scripture. Uh, and, and we all do this as we talk, right? Everybody was saying this. Well, was it literally everybody? No. Okay. Here Paul is using hyperbole. All the world has heard of the, the faithfulness of the Roman Christians. Well, what he means is, is uh, the churches around the Mediterranean area there is really uh, the, the Roman world, we might say, is what he's talking about there. What does that tell us about the congregation? They were active. 
they're, they're out there. Yes, they're active in their faith. They're large. They're, it's probably a sizable congregation. Yeah. They're communicating and sharing messages. Okay. So, so whatever it is that they're up to, that's getting shared around and uh, uh, passed around. Yeah, I think those are all conclusions we could probably reach from those uh, from from Paul's statement here. Uh, we're going to see here in just a moment. Is it the next thing? Oh yes, it's the very next thing. Uh, there's an event that has happened at the congregation that has greatly affected them and caused information about them to get around. Um, let's take a moment. Normally, I try to keep everybody in the same book uh, or in the same page when we're going. But let's take a moment. Let's turn to Acts, which is the book just before Romans. Go to the book of Acts, chapter 18. Acts, chapter 18. And we'll read about an event there of some significance. Acts 18, verses 2 through 4 is what we would like to read. And it's got a, a few uh, different names in it. Does anybody feel comfortable enough to read that? Or shall I do it? And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome, and he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. Okay, thank you, Rob. Yeah, they're Latin-based Latin names, so they're, they're somewhat familiar to us as, as English speakers. Um, What's the big event that has affected the life of the Roman congregation? All of you have to leave. Claudius, the emperor, yeah. says, you people get out of here. <laughs> if you can imagine this, they've been exiled from Rome. And the interesting thing about this is that there's a Roman historian who tells us what the reason is. It's a fellow by the name of Suetonius. He's writing after the fact. Uh, later in, in the history. Uh, but he tells us that the Jews were arguing about a fellow named, I mentioned this in a previous class, they were arguing about a guy named Prestus. <laughs> and some were saying he was dead, and some were saying he's alive. Who are they talking about? Christ. They're talking about Christ. More than likely, that's what the debate was about. And it, the, the presence of Christian teaching was so stirring up the Jewish people, and there was probably, it's the heart of the empire, right? It, it's the capital. There was probably a sizable Jewish community present there. We know, for example, in the uh, catacombs, uh, there are a bunch of Jewish catacombs, and there's Jewish names and Jewish uh, menorahs and stuff like that carved into them. So we know there was a Jewish presence in Rome from that kind of information. Uh, but uh, this teaching about Crestus or Christ was really apparently dividing and, and exciting the Jewish community that had gathered there in the first century. And so Claudius's, Claudius's solution is to say, if you're Jewish, you've got to leave. Who gets affected by this? Most, well, the, most Jewish people, but in Acts 18, there's, two, there's a couple. Who's, who's the couple? Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla and Aquila. They get exiled, and they, they happen to meet St. Paul because of this. And they settle down, they're sharing the same trade. What's the trade that uh, Priscilla and Aquila and Paul are flying? Tent makers. Tent makers. Now, when you hear tent maker, you, you probably automatically think of camping. 
right? And that's okay. They, they, uh, the Roman army would have needed tents, wouldn't they? They would have needed things like that for uh, carrying on their foreign wars and all of that stuff. Uh, probably another thing that these tent makers did as they were working with canvas, sales. Sales, <laughs> sales for ships would be another uh, big <laughs> application of working with canvas in that era. So, uh, so which they were doing, it doesn't, it doesn't say. It uses the name tent makers, so maybe we should think of the soldiers. But uh, they may have also been outfitting the navy as well for the sake of the ships. Uh, I think when Paul meets them, yeah, they're in Corinth. Corinth is a big seaport in Greece, and uh, you can see them either making sails for the ships or making tents that would go on the ships and then be taken out to wherever the army posts were at that time. So it gives you a picture of the kind of work <coughs> the apostle was doing as he carried on his mission work. Any comments or questions about this event with the a Acts 18, the Jews getting sent out of Rome and the fighting over Crestus? Was it because the Jews were fighting, fighting over Crestus? That's why they just wanted them out. Mm. Yeah, so, so what happens is what the Apostle Paul does, we see in Acts, and whoever was first to Rome to bring the gospel probably did the same thing. As they traveled into the city, they found the local Jewish synagogue, and they went in there and started teaching them that the Old Testament uh, stories you've been hearing about the coming of Christ, he's here, and his name is Jesus. And some of the people would have gone, wow, how wonderful, that's exciting. That's what we see in, in the other parts of Acts as Paul's going around preaching. And others were like, what are you talking about? That can't be. No way. <laughs> and, uh, and it turns into this big argument as a consequence of that. That's what we see happening again and again in Acts. Uh, they usually, as missionaries, would start at the Jewish synagogue because those were the people who knew the Old Testament and the prophecies of that Old Testament. Um, on the first day we talked about Romans, one of the things I did was I had us read or look at a whole list of names. I think it was in chapter 15 of Romans. We looked at a whole list of names there. And one of the things we pointed out was that out of all of that list, there was only one clear Hebrew or Jewish name. Do you remember what the name was? Mary. The name was Mary. All the others were either Greek or Roman or Latin-based names. There's only one Jewish one. And here I think we have an explanation of why. Because the Jews had been chased out of the congregation, hadn't they? And what was left, for the most part, was Gentiles. Gentile believers there in Rome. And yet the faithfulness of the congregation uh, and, and uh, their dedication to the way of the Lord that must have been carried by those displaced Jewish people everywhere that they went, their fellow believers who were Jewish, and spread the fame of the congregation. So that gives us a picture of the setting and situation here. Persecution starts pretty early in the church's history, doesn't it? Pretty early on. Any questions or comments about uh, this background for the book of Romans and what's happening here. All right. Let's have somebody read verses 11 and 12 and see what's happening there. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. The end of uh, to the end you may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. Okay, thank you, Brian. 
So what did Paul want to give the Romans? Spiritual gift. Spiritual gift. What is that? <laughs> is it the encouragement to, to encourage each other? Mm. Yeah, he follows up with a comment right after that, doesn't he? Uh, that I may impart you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. So in this situation, it seems to be the kind of encouragement, comfort, consolation that we share with one another as God's people. Now, the same expression for spiritual gift gets used in other ways in other parts of the New Testament. For example, in uh, 1 Corinthians, St. Paul gives a list of spiritual gifts, and he's mentioning things like, like uh, prophecy and healing and uh, speaking in other languages and these kinds of things. Uh, but here it seems to be the care, the comfort, the consolation that God's people share with one another as we go through life. I want to invite you for a moment to think back over your life. From whom have you received this kind of spiritual gift? Jim? The church. Through, through your church? Very good. Through parents. Mm -hmm. Parents would be key in that. Brian? Mrs. Callahan. Mrs. Callahan. Tell us about Mrs. Callahan. Mrs. Callahan had a little Bible study for the neighborhood. She had, said she had a board with figurines and told stories from the Bible and all. <coughs> she uh, encouraged us to memorize passages like John 3.16. Uh-huh. What, was that in this neighborhood? Oh, no. No. North End. It was on the North End. Okay. Okay. God bless Mrs. Callahan. That's wonderful. <coughs> Elders, examples of spiritual encouragement from your life. My aunt, my mom. Your aunt and your mom? They came here. They drug me here. They, dra they <laughs> drug you here? <laughs> Not really. And, <laughs> but, yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's always a tension, isn't there, between bringing the kids to church and forcing the kids to come to church, right? There's a tension that rises. And, uh, yeah, parents will ask me, should I force my children to come? And I usually say, they'll appreciate it later in life. You know, you don't want to beat them out the door, but uh, but, gui but guiding them to the care of this, this mutual encouragement of the church, I, they'll grow to appreciate it. If you can lead them gently to it, it'll happen. They led me. Pastor Torius convinced me to stay. <laughs> just, Good. just listening to him. I, yeah? I, I really liked him. That was a blessing mm -hmm. to hear pa your pastor. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah. Carol Adams. Carol Adams. Never gave up on inviting me to church. <laughs> yeah. And that's been, I think, over 30 years ago. Wow. Yeah. God bless Carol. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, Mike. My wife. Your wife? Yeah. Okay. You throw a spouse in there. Throw a spouse in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> throw a spouse into the mix. Yeah. Uh, Pastor Satorius used to say, you don't send them to church, you take them to church. Yeah. Okay. Remember that? Okay. I, I think, uh, for me, I think it was the Holy Spirit. Mm. It just kept working on me, you know, mm. pushing. Yeah. Pushing. The Spirit of God is at work through the people in our lives, isn't it? He works through other people as they speak to us, as they care for us, as they encourage us. That's for sure. Very good. 
I can remember a Sunday school teacher I had years ago. Of course, my parents made sure I was at church, and they brought me. My, my family was a church-going family. In fact, uh, at, uh, at our congregation where I grew up, we took up the pews one summer so we could sand the floor and, uh, and uh, you know, get, get the, the floor back in order. And the pews where the Engelbrecht sat, were, the, the floor was worn out. <laughs> uh, we all came and we all sat in the same spot <laughs> and it rubbed the varnish off the floor um, so uh, so yeah dad was an elder mom played uh, the, the piano and organ for the church and we were involved in all of that and then Sunday came you just knew you were going to church that's just how it was you just you know you didn't you didn't think up why but um, uh, I was going to say something about Mrs. Tornator. She taught Sunday school for us. I must have been in my early teens because uh, I was acolyting at the time. And this is, it's funny what you can remember from a teacher. The thing I remember her saying, which to me was great consolation, I told her that I had done something wrong when I went up to do the acolyting. I had done the candles wrong somehow. I forget what I did. And she just looked at me and smiled, and she says, that'll be okay. <laughs> That's all right. God, God doesn't mind. And probably nobody noticed. <laughs> I have a very specific memory of her saying that to me. I, I must have felt very relieved. <laughs> so the mutual care and consolation that you share... And uh, when you get an opportunity to do that with your brothers and sisters gathering here, with the little ones who are gathering here, okay, look for those opportunities to show that kindness that Christ has put in your heart and in your life. Okay? Very good. All right, now I'm going to turn this around. I was talking about how people have done this for you. How have you done this for someone else? How have you shared this mutual consolation support? Grandchildren. With your grandchildren. <laughs> yeah. I see a number of heads bobbing. I was going to say with my children. Say again? With my children. With your children. I got one son that still goes to church every Sunday. Good. In the evenings. My youngest son, I don't know about him. Okay. <laughs> And we're always happy to see April yeah, on, on Wednesday night. I've got April with me. My granddaughter comes sometimes. Yeah. Summer wants to yeah. yeah. For, for uh, BBS. Right. Yeah. My uh, cousins. Okay. Uh, and I didn't even know it until, I don't know, some, probably 10, 10 years ago when it came up to the school. Uh, I was, I just, Said you got you got to be a Christian. You got to live for God, live mm. for Christ. Mm. And um, we, uh, matter of fact, he became a person that ran the uh, concerts at uh, Dear Desmond. That was his ministry to God to, to reach out to people. And uh, it was actually at the concert he come and told me, he said, "Well, he says I wouldn't be doing this if you hadn't pressed God to me." Okay. And, uh, I was, I didn't even know I did it. Mm. I just knew I had said it throughout the time. Mm. And that came from my mom a lot, too. We probably don't know the number of lives that we have touched by the way we have lived for Christ and spoken for Christ. Uh, other examples? Yeah, Jim? Not that I'm so great. Okay. Yeah, and, and that's not what this is about. The this is about having an, an uh, uh, environment of sharing. Go ahead. At a barber shop and just people. Okay. Yeah, you've talked with me a little bit about some of those barbershop conversations you have. Yeah. I didn't know you need to get your hair cut that off. <laughs> you didn't do a very good job either. <laughs> Anyone else? How you're sharing like that. Go ahead. Oh, well, Deb and Jim Young are my aunt and uncle. And they had something happen, and I told them, you've been really blessed to need to get to church. <laughs> and here they are. Okay. And that was years ago. Yes. Yeah. So we come here to offer our thanks to God 
for the kindnesses and mercies he shows in our lives. Yeah, that's a proper encouragement. Yeah, the psalmist talks that way. I'm going to stand and give thanks among God's people. That's what he says at the temple. Yeah. Well, wonderful. Folks, keep it up. Keep it up. Share that word of encouragement, that mutual con consolation and care for the people around you. Uh, it is how God works between us in our lives. It's, it's a great and tremendous blessing when we do. Carry on. All right. Let's look at verse 13. Someone read for us verse 13. I want you to know, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you, as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. Mm, thank you. So what harvest does Paul intend to reap among these Romans? Believers? Hmm. Okay. To, to reap to reap some uh, souls, people people coming to faith. Yeah. Okay. It says here, unaware of brothers. <coughs> unaware of brothers. Uh, he refers to brothers. It says unaware of brothers. Unaware of brothers. Yeah, but they did not know. I assume that's what he means. Uh, I want you to know, brothers. What? Which translation do you have, Jim? What's your read? EBS. It, it's the ESV. Or ESV. <laughs> okay. Go ahead and read read that passage to me. <laughs> okay, it's in verse 13. Yeah. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers. Oh, unaware. So he's saying to them, I don't want you to be uh, confused or, or missing out on something about his intentions. Okay? So, uh, so that's more the sense of it. The word brothers there, it's interesting. Paul uses this word quite a bit in the New Testament, um, <coughs> brothers. Now, what does he mean by brothers? We always have brothers and sisters in Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ. So it's not your blood relation. Okay? He's not talking about his blood relation. He's talking about fellow members of the congregation. And typically Paul uses the masculine form. Uh, he's addressing uh, the, the male leadership in the congregation. Some of the translations have taken to adding to this sisters, but it's not there. If, you, if your translation does that, uh, be aware it's not there in the Greek. Uh, it doesn't speak that way. Uh, he is usually addressing the male leadership of the congregation as he writes his letters, and that's why he tends to use that brothers. Um, something to be aware of. Um, let's see, I intended to come to you uh, in order that I may reap some harvest among you, Mike has proposed that he's looking to reap a harvest of souls, uh, believe, new believers, people coming to the Lord. Any other options? I think they get to know each other and they feed off of each other. Okay. Okay, so there's a spiritual harvest perhaps that's involved as they're coming together and that mutual con consolation and care that we were just talking about. The spiritual gifts in that respect. Plus, don't they just go out and maybe witness to other people? Uh, no doubt that was happening in Rome. No doubt that was going on. There's another type of harvest, though, that I think might be behind Paul's expression here. You remember why he was writing this letter? What he was up to? He needs money. He needs money. <laughs> why does he need the money? To travel. To travel. Where is he going? Bermuda? Spain. 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 So, <laughs> so he might be referring here to mission support. He might be thinking of mission support. And uh, uh, gathering up what he needs to make that trip all the way out to Spain and start a new mission among the Gentiles. And there's probably Jews there as well but to start a new congregation out in that neck of the world. I like your other answers, too. I think 
I think uh, those are other things that we can think of, but we shouldn't overlook that he might be asking for an offering in this because of the mission aspect of the work uh, that uh, was the cause for writing the letter. Any comments or questions about any of that as we're passing through the first part of the letter here? Uh, someone read for us verses 14 and 15. I am debtor both to the Greek and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. You said 13? Uh, 14 and 15. Okay. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Okay. To whom did Paul feel obligated? To all people. Greeks and barbarians. Greeks and barbarians. Who are Greeks and barbarians? Gentiles. They're, they're, gent, they're, they're especially the Gentiles, aren't they? They're especially the Gentiles. Being a Jew, uh, Paul would, uh, if his mission and calling was to the Jews, he would have probably naturally mentioned them. But Paul saw his calling as especially to people who were not Jewish. This is a part of the reason he probably wants to go out there to Spain to further the mission to the folks out there. Who's living in Spain at this time? The Spanish. The Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, not so much. Oh. <laughs> Romans? Uh, the, there would be Romans there. The Romans had conquered the area. Who lived out in that uh, far western parts of Europe? Back in the day. Are there any the Moors? Not the Moors. The Moors come later. Okay, the Moors come later. That's from the Arab time. So uh, about six or seven hundred years later. Barbarians. They're barbarians. Yeah. The Celts are the Gaelic. The Celts are Gaelic people. So the Gauls. Uh, Caesar goes and he fights the Gauls, especially in France. Uh, what we call France today and, and would have been uh, parts of Germany, I think, as well. Uh, but it's, it's Celtic people. So it's people that are akin to uh, your Irish and your, your um, Scotch and your Welsh. And, and those people, they were more settled in this region. And then the Romans went in there, conquered them. They started intermarrying. And then you get Spanish people and French people and... And uh, all of those, that mix of people that's there. And then uh, uh, somebody mentioned the Moors. Later on, the Arabs come and they invade Spain and they control Spain for quite a while until the Spaniards uh, push them out. And there's some interrelation there as well. There's lots of Arabic words in Spanish, they tell me. I've not studied all it myself. Their, all their buildings and stuff are at the Arabs. They're, they're, they're influenced by the architecture and all of that. You see those influences. So, to, But to get a clearer picture of who Paul is probably going to, it's probably Gaelic or Gaulish people. Uh, you remember one of the letters that Paul writes in the New Testament is to a group, uh, or a group he calls the Galatians. Right? The letter to the Galatians, I think it's an A in the spelling, uh, we might call them the Galatians because they are tribally related to these folks that are all the way out there in the West region. Uh, a group of Gauls came fighting their way down into the Roman Empire and they went down into Asia Minor. Uh, these tribal movements in uh, the northern part of Europe, western part of, or excuse me, the eastern part of Europe, were going on during the Roman Empire, and these settlers in Galatia are Gauls. They're akin to them. So he's met people like this before, and probably was somewhat familiar with their customs and ideas. Jim, go ahead. I just wondered. Uh, of course, there was no Protestants or anything in those days. The Catholic Church. Yeah, the, those kind of distinctions come much um, later in the history. Are Catholics eventually. Yeah, they come. That comes later in the history. So. Yeah, at this time, it's we call it the early church, and the, the the big deal is Jews and Gentiles. That's the big tension in the earliest centuries of the church. 
is a relation of Jews and Gentiles. Uh, let's have somebody read now verses 16 and 17. This is a key passage in Romans, verses 16 and 17. For I, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Okay, as you look through that passage there, what word is Paul emphasizing? Faith. 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 The, one of the big terms here early on in Romans is faith. What's faith? Belief. Believing in something you can't see. Without Believing in something maybe you can't see. The word I like to use when talking about faith and explaining it to the kids is trust. Trust. That gives you, I think, a stronger sense of what faith is. It means trust. So we live by trust. Trust in God and His promises and His word. He uses kind of an odd expression here. Uh, talks about from faith to faith. Uh, literally it says... Out of faith into faith. <laughs> That's literally how it, it reads. Let's look at it that way. Uh, for it is the righteousness of God is revealed out of faith into faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And I think what Paul is referring to here is this. Our Christian life begins from faith or out of faith. We're born again as we trust in our God and as we get to know Him and who He is. And, and from that, He guides us into what we call, if you see somebody do this before, the faith. The faith. What do we mean when we say the faith? We capitalize faith. Faith in Christ. He died for us. Forgive us our sins. Okay, so that's a part of the message. That's a part of the message of the gospel. The faith would be the whole body of Christian doctrine and practice. That great whole body of Christian doctrine and practice. So it starts very simply, doesn't it? It starts with simple trust in God and his promise. But that leads us into something much, much deeper and much, much more into the wholeness of that life of faith that God has for us in Christ. Think about the disciples. Jesus says to them, follow me <coughs> on the shore of Galilee. And they go, okay. Could they ever have imagined what that beginning would have led to. What it would have led to. So Paul is telling us we live by faith, we live by that simple trust, but it leads us into something deeper, something more. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, where God is taking us in Christ and His righteousness. And the Bible passage he quotes there uh, is from the book of Habakkuk, which is uh, one of those minor prophets. Uh, but it's, it's one of the most quoted Bible passages in the New Testament. Uh, there, there are some others that would uh, rival it, but this is one of the most quoted. The righteous shall live by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. Okay? 
And what Romans is going to do from here through about chapter 11 is going to be expounding this idea of righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ. That that is who God takes us to be and how God makes us who we are as Christians. Okay? So we're we'll looking for and listening for this theme of righteousness through faith throughout the letter. Questions or comments? This morning. <coughs> Okay. Thanks for listening in. Let's bow our heads and have a prayer again. Dearest Lord Jesus Christ, we praise and thank you for that first moment, whether it was the day of our baptism, whether it was a word from a friend or a Sunday school teacher or a parent, that first moment when we learned of you and the work of your Spirit in our hearts and our lives to bring forth in us faith. Lord, help us out of that faith to walk into a life of sincere trust, fullness of mercy and kindness, to live out that righteousness that you have imparted to us in your Son, Jesus Christ, who is our only Savior. Amen. Thanks so much, folks.